Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well this evening. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. I know we're just a couple minutes late, maybe a minute or two, but not too bad, I guess. But uh, we're go we're going to get started this evening and uh, just get right into the word. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. We just got out of a fantabulous cantata practice. It was amazing, incredible. You should have been there. Um, I mean, it was all right. But uh, anyway, we, we just got done with cantata practice. We're looking forward to that. That's going to be on the, I think it's the 17th of December, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the king is born. Amen, right? And so it's going to be a great time. And um, you know, make sure that you bring family out. And then, of course, we'll be eating after that. So speaking of eating, if we're meeting, we're eating, right? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is our church Thanksgiving dinner. And it's going to be at 6 o'clock in the p.m., the post-meridian. And that is with the uh, Eastern Standard Time now, since Daylight Savings is over. So please make sure that you all are coming out for that. It's going to be a wonderful time. We're going to enjoy ourselves, have a great meal, and uh, just, you know, like we always do, just come on together and just be family and have some fellowship. So that's going to be tomorrow night at 6. So please keep that in mind if you would. And then next week is Thanksgiving. How many ready for some Thanksgiving? I, I think sometimes I'm looking forward more to the Thanksgiving meal than I am to Christmas, believe it or not. So, um, but Thanksgiving is next week, and so we will have our, of course, regular service on Sunday morning. Tuesday, we're, um, if you are, it's just a fellowship meeting service kind of thing. Uh, the Low Country Ministerial Fellowship is putting a community Thanksgiving service together at Santee Circle Church of God. Not community church, but the Church of God. Um, you know, just right there when you turn right on 52, it's just, just down the road a little bit. And uh, that's going to begin, I believe we said at 7, did we? Does anybody have a bulletin by chance on them? No? Oh, we do. See, Sister Susie, God bless you. It's on the back at the top. What time do we have? We have 6 or 7? Seven? 7? That's what I said, 7 o'clock. So that'll be at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. So if you want to come out uh, for that, uh, we're going to be having worship and communion and um uh, different ministers are going to be doing different things. I'll be over the communion. So come on out for that at Santee Circle Church of God. And then we will not have Wednesday night next week because y'all are busy baking for your pastor. So please make sure and bake for your pastor. That's great. And by the way, just as a word of encouragement to you, um, I'm not strictly gluten-free anymore. So there's that. All right. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've got lots of stuff coming up in December. Make sure that you look at the back of the bulletin. At the, the back of the bulletin has a uh, kind of some save the dates for December. And so keep that in mind. There is one other thing my wife wanted me to make sure I mention. The Friday after Thanksgiving is um, the Macedonia Christmas tree lighting at the fire department. And they have a little program. And it's a great thing to bring kids to or grandkids. They have a little program, have some little crafts they can do, some snacks, that kind of thing. But your pastor has been asked to do the Christmas program for the night. Um, now, I would tell you what I'm going to be doing, but I don't know yet. So we'll figure that out before next Friday is what we'll do. But um, uh, nothing like last-minute ministry. That needs to be the title of any kind of ministry foundation I start. It's like, hi, I'm Chris Bambro from Last Minute Ministries. Hallelujah. All right, so... Um, but she wanted me to make sure to mention that. So come on out. It's going to be a fun time. Um, please don't ask me what time. I, I really don't know. But there were some things that were passed out Sunday. Anybody have one of those? You hoarders? No? Nobody? Okay. All right, that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, there were these little things that were passed out on Sunday, and we should probably have some extras in the church. But uh, ah ha ha, what time does that start? It's 4 to 6. Ah, oh, so if you come at 7, you're late. I'm glad I've, glad I, and what's the date on that again? I think I'm busy. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be doing that. All right, so uh, on the 25th uh, from 4 to 6 at the Macedonia Fire Department, bring out your kids, grandkids, somebody else's kids, whatever, and uh, we're going to have a good time, and it'll, it'll be a nice little way to uh, kind of kick off the Christmas holiday. So anyway, uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer as we open up, and then we'll get into the Word this evening. Um, you know, just uh, remember all those that are, are just 
going through stuff. We want to definitely also remember our girls. Our girls are going to the girls' retreat this weekend. So on Friday, they're heading out to Myrtle Beach and uh, going to get a tan or something. I don't know. But they're going to the girls' retreat. We want them to have a great time, but we also want them to have a wonderful time in the Lord. So please keep our, our girls and the chaperones in your prayers. I would appreciate that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll get right into the Word, and I'll try to get you out of here by 10 o'clock tonight. All right? Father, we thank you so much for all of your wonderful blessings and for another day that we can come together as a church body, that we can come together and we can hear the Word, we can study the Word so we can know you more. Lord, we just pray that you'll be with us tonight as we go through the Word, open our minds and our hearts to be able to receive the Word today. I pray, God, that you will help us to uh, continue to remember our church family that is sick or in need or going through just different difficulties, God. We just pray blessings upon them and healing upon them and favor upon them. Lord, we pray for our girls that are going to the girls' retreat and the, the chaperones as well, that you'll protect them as they travel, but also, Lord, that they'll have a wonderful time fellowshipping together, but also hearing the word of God. And I pray, Lord, that they'll come back with a new fire and a new spirit that has been stirred up within them. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And... Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit. I don't really have a title necessarily uh, for what I want to talk to you about tonight. But in case you haven't noticed, there's a whole bunch of religions around the world, all sorts of them. And even just here in the United States, there are all different kinds of religions, all different kinds of ways that people want to believe, that people say that they have faith and all this kind of thing. And honestly, a vast majority of them are, are cults. And a cult is um, it's an abnormal uh, religious belief that, that does not um, necessarily adhere to anything that is uh, considered common or considered uh, ordinary. And most of the time in cults, one of the, or a couple of the big things about cults is, number one, they make an effort to separate you from your family. Instead of you necessarily going out and trying to tell people about your religion, they try to keep you in their little group, and they try to separate you from your family. Number two, they usually will say it's only our four and no more. Nobody else is going to heaven. Nobody else has, has got the answer. Everybody else is wrong, and everybody else is going to wherever they consider the bad place, if it's hell or if it's you know, New York or whatever it is. Um, but uh, you know, they, they, they will tell you that they're the only ones with the right answers. And then you also have where they will... Many times they will uh, demand your absolute, unquestioned obedience to their leader, and uh, as well as turning over financial uh, uh, means and turning over uh, even power of attorney in some cases, you know, that sort of thing. So a lot of these are cults. Some of them are simply religions that have been made up because somebody wanted tax-exempt status, honestly. Uh, there are There is a church, and I use that word and put the air quotes around it, there is a church uh, that meets on the beaches in California, and it's, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's something like the first church of the enlightened herbage or something, it, it's a church where they get to smoke weed, and their religious right, as far as like, like we would have communion, they smoke weed, and, um, and so the whole reason they created this religion was because they wanted to have the religious right to be able to smoke marijuana. And California was just smart enough to let them get away with it. Uh, but there's all sorts of different religions, but I'm, I'm not going to deal with the, the fringe ones, the ones that are kind of woohoo, you know, and all that sort of thing um, that we may hear about on the news, there being a shooting and all that kind of stuff. But I do want to kind of real quickly mention a couple of religions that possibly you have come in contact with, possibly some things that you have uh, you have seen, and maybe you've even wondered, how do we know that they're not right? And I want to share something with you. I, I was at, of all places, I was at the Ministerial Internship Program Commissioning Service in Cleveland, Tennessee for the Church of God. This was back in 1996, I think it was if I'm not mistaken, and I was in Cleveland, Tennessee, which if you're in the Church of God, they say Mecca. And that means Cleveland, Tennessee, because everybody, I mean, there's like 400 churches of God in Tennessee, in Cleveland, Tennessee, and most of them are running five 
but everybody wants to be in Cleveland because that's the holy place, and maybe I'll get picked as general overseer. But, um, but I was in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I saw this pamphlet, and I picked it up to see what it was because I saw what looked like to be Jesus on the front, and it was. But it was a Jehovah's Witness watchtower. Uh, not, not the actual full magazine, but it was one of their, their pieces of literature. And so they were saying some things in this, and yeah, I was just reading it. I was just out of out of curiosity. I was reading it, and I actually I I began to get kind of nervous because there were some things that they were saying that were seeming to make sense. See, that's one of the things we need to understand. These religions that are are not correct, that don't go along with the Bible, they aren't all just wackadoo. They aren't all just like the flying spaghetti monster or hey, we can smoke weed because the Bible says that God gave us every herb, and so, you know, pass me the herb, friend. You know, that. I mean, they're not all like that. Many of them seem to really have some pretty sensible uh, ideas of what they're talking about, and they seem to have, have come up with some answers that maybe we haven't thought about. This is why we study to show ourselves approved unto God, is because if you don't know the Bible, how are you going to tell if somebody's telling you something wrong in the Bible? If you don't know that it's wrong because you don't read it yourself, you can't refute it and you can't stay away from it. So I'm reading this, and like I said, there were a couple of things that really, it, it, it just caught me on one of those days. And, um, and I got kind of nervous. I thought, well, my Lord, that actually makes sense, and I don't have an answer off the top of my head for this, what am I going to do? Well, I was a young guy at the time, and you know, young minister, and so I thought that it was required of every minister to have every answer for every Bible question at all times. It is not, because there's a bunch of stuff I still don't know, even after decades of studying the Word of God, of preaching the Word of God, of teaching the Word of God. There's still a whole lot... Of, this is the word of God. How am I going to comprehend that all with this little mind? But what I have done is because I study, I, I know how to get into the word. I know how to find the answers, and I know how to you know what to look for so that I can get those answers. And I did eventually do that with this Jehovah's Witness thing. I, I eventually saw what they were talking about. I was like, wait a minute, hold on a second. Let me see in Scripture, and I compared it to Scripture, and I realized that you know where they had gone off the track. But The point of that is that these religions that have millions of followers have millions of followers for a reason. Because they have phrased things and framed things in a way to make sense. Um, Sister Sherry Ward was, uh, we were visiting with them a little bit uh, the other day, and she had happened to mention, she had told me before about how you were actually raised in the Mormon church. Is that correct? The LDS church, excuse me. Uh, apparently Mormon is a, a slur in some places. They they consider it to be bad to say Mormon or something. I don't know. That's that's what I saw on TV, and TV's always right. But anyway, um, you know, she was actually raised in in the LDS Church, and some of the things that they talk about, you know, it seems nice. I mean, they 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 push family, they push purity, they push you know uh, you know living a, a life that is is uh, humbling and is serving to others. I mean. I don't know how many of you know any Mormons. They're some of the nicest people you ever want to meet. Not all of them. I'm sure there's a couple of jerks in there. But, um, but I mean, the, most, most of the Mormons that I have met are actually really nice people. And because of that, there have been a lot of Christians that have said, well, I'm sure they're going to heaven. But ni- nice people don't go to heaven. Thank God, Tom, right? Amen. Uh, you know, nice people, that's not the requirement to go to heaven. It's about being born again. And so people begin to make excuses and all this kind of thing. Well, what I wanted to, to point out to you today, and like I said, I don't necessarily have a title for this, but what I wanted to point out to you is some of the reasons why, like, for example, with Mormonism or with Jehovah's Witness or even with just some of the, well, even a mainstream religion, and um, you know, if you're watching online and you happen to be a Catholic, please don't attack me. I'm just telling you the way it is, and if you have friends that are Catholic, I'm not attacking your Catholic friends. I'm not somebody that's saying that the Pope is the Antichrist and all that kind of mess, although I do think he is way off base, uh, the guy that they've got right now. But I'm going to just tell you a couple of things about those religions as far as why we need to realize that they are not 
even though they're classified as Christian, they are not born again, all right? Here's the thing. Jehovah's Witnesses are classified as a Christian religion, which we're like, I don't think so. Yes, they are, because Jesus Christ is a key member or is a key component to their teachings, all right? Mormonism is considered a Christian religion. Mitt Romney is considered a Christian. Even though there are things, and, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about it, but there are some things in the Mormon beliefs that are contrary to what we believe in the, in the word. But they're considered a Christian religion. We throw that word Christian out a lot. And in, in many circles, all it means is that you're not Jewish or, or Buddhist or Muslim. It's like, well, if, if you were raised in America, then you're Christian by default. That's not the way that it works. And, and so we're not talking about just being a Christian, meaning that Jesus is in there someplace. We're talking about being born again, all right? So the first thing I want to talk about is the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, you know, some of the problems with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, some of you, uh, how many of you know a Jehovah's Witness, or maybe you used to be a Jehovah's Witness or anything? Nobody. You know why? We don't open the door when they come. Not one of us wants to open the door when they come. No, actually I do. I bet Brother Sonny does too. I, I have. I've opened the door when they've come and I've talked with them and then they stop coming. Because I, I remember one time I was at a friend's house and I was just kind of chilling and they weren't home and Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door and I said, hey, how's it going? And, yo, they were surprised I opened. And, um, and yo, it was two ladies that came walking up and, you know, one was kind of stepping back a little bit like that. The other one had the notebook and was doing the speaking, and she began talking, and, and she said, well, you know, what do you believe as far as it's going to happen to this world? And I said, I'm so glad you, you asked me that. Let me tell you, what's going to happen is this, is that at any moment, because we don't know the day or the hour, no, not even the angels in heaven, but the Father only knows when the trumpet is going to sound, and then the dead are going to be raised up and uh, first, those who are dead in Christ, and then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, and forever we will be with the Lord. So that's what's going to happen first. But then we're going to get into the tribulation. She stopped me. She goes, well, go, okay, 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 so you go to church. And I was like, oh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I didn't tell her I was a preacher yet, and I didn't tell her I was Pentecostal yet because I wanted to have fun. And so she, she started saying, well, let me tell you something about what's in your Bible. And I said, in my Bible? Okay, tell me. And she said, do you know that in the Bible it says that Jesus isn't God? And I said, you are wrong. And I said, for example, John 1.1, 1, 1, which actually was the first verse I was going to mention today. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And that's capitalized in the English because of the fact that it was obvious from the translation. We're talking about a title for Jesus Christ. The whole book is about Jesus. It's a gospel. So why would we be talking about, you know, Murray down the road? You know, we're talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they said, aha, here's the problem. See, in your King James Version, it says was God, but in the actual translation of the Scriptures, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And I said, is that right? And she said, yes. And I said, which translation? And she said, in our Bible. I said, well, duh. Of course it says that in your Bible. But I'm talking about what does that say in the Greek? Well, in the Greek, it is there. And I said, can you show me that? Well, I don't have a Greek Bible with me. Oh, I don't either. But let me ask you this. I said, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? And she said, oh, absolutely. And I said, do you believe thou shalt have no other gods before me? Yes, yes, the very first of the Ten Commandments. Right, so if, if Jesus is a God, and yet when he was baptized, the Father said, Behold, you know, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he said, Hear him. Why was, why was God exalting another God if there's to be no other gods before him? Well, but Jesus was a, a type of God. Oh, he's a type of God. Okay. I said, Do you believe he was perfect? Oh, yes, absolutely. He was perfect, but he wasn't God. He was a type of God. So we have a perfect God, the Father, but we also have a perfect God who's Jesus. And, and Jehovah, the Father, is above Jesus, but, but yet he was telling everybody to worship him. Can you explain that? Well, you know, we have some differences in opinions. I said, yes, we do. Hey, let me talk to you about a few things about Jesus. And I began to tell 
And she was so kind to stand there, and her friend was getting so nervous and kept looking behind her like, is there anybody else coming? Where's the Calvary? That sort of thing. We stood there for about half an hour, and she finally says, you know, I don't think we're going to come to a consensus between us. I said, I wish we would. I really wish we would. And she said, you have a good day. And then she turned around and walked away. And I was like, I win! And, uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> I told my friend about it, and you know, he, he was just like, thanks. And I was like, yeah, I told him to come back because you had some better answers. for No, um, but Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, you know, we mostly know them because they come to the door. And, and you know, most Christians, honestly, what they'll do is if they knock on the door, they just won't answer. Or else they'll open the door and they, they'll, they'll realize they're the Jehovah's Witnesses and then they'll say, ah, I'm, I'm a Christian, I don't need this. And then they'll close the door and walk away. And let me tell you, you tell a Jehovah's Witness you're a Christian, that doesn't mean anything to them because they consider themselves Christians as well. So you're not really, you're not telling them anything. They're used to the door being closed in their face. And yet, and yet, the religion still grows. I think I, I, think I had heard that 11, they, they have estimated that 1,100 no's equal a yes. That after 1,100 people say no, the next person says yes, is what their statistics have said. Well, think about how many times these people go out, and we can't get people to come to church. But these people are going out door to door to door with, in the South with people with weapons and dogs. And they're going door to door because they're trying to tell about Jehovah and all this. And the problem is, is that their religion is wrong. They consider Jesus to be, um, to be a, a type of God, to be a prophet of Jehovah. However, he is not divine. He is not God. And, and so it is Jehovah and only Jehovah that we worship. They also have some other things like, for example, they don't celebrate birthdays. The reason they don't celebrate birthdays is because nobody good in the Bible ever, ce ever celebrated a birthday, and so that means that it's, it's a sin to celebrate a birthday. Well, nobody in the Bible ever drove a car either. We're all in trouble. You know, I mean, it's like just because somebody didn't do something in the Bible doesn't mean that nobody else should do it. If God says don't do it, that's a whole different story. But, you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say one person flush the toilet. But I'd prefer if you guys did. Honestly, um, they don't celebrate Easter and Christmas because of the, the pagan background behind those holidays and, and all this kind of thing. And, but another reason they wouldn't celebrate Christmas is because they don't consider Jesus God. They consider him just a prophet of God. They even go so far as, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a Jewish Jesus, uh, not Jewish, a Jehovah's Witness Jesus on the cross. It's not a cross. It's, it's like just a big old piece of lumber, and he's like this. Because they believe that the cross, that we took that from Egyptian mythology because that's the sign of an Egyptian god. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of him, something with a T. But uh, tall, I think it is. It's a sign of an Egyptian god. And so they believe that the Christian church that we know, that you know, we have crosses everywhere, that actually we're celebrating uh, Egyptian uh, mythology and Egyptian religion because of the fact that there's a cross beam. So, it, yeah, if you, ever, if you ever pick up a Jehovah's Witness watchtower and they have a picture of Jesus on the cross, you'll see it's just one board and he's like this. I mean, they get into those particulars and everything, but yet they say that Jesus is not divine. Mormonism, and please correct me if I get anything wrong, all right? Mormonism, they actually believe that there is God and that there were many sons of God. And that Lucifer is actually a son of God. I mean, like to the same level of Jesus as far as he was born of God. And that he wanted to take earth, but that the father chose Jesus instead. And so that's why he, he got mad. Basically, they're saying that Lucifer is thrown to hissy fit. And that's why he's, he's mad and everything. But that Jesus and, and Satan are actually brothers, because they, they are both from the Father. They believe that when, you, that when you die, that if you die baptized in the Mormon church, and you know, you've got the special garments and all that kind of thing and whatever, and you, ba you die baptized in the Mormon church, that you actually, in fact, there was a, a book that came out in the 70s or 80s called The God Makers that was about the Mormon church, that you actually will become 
a god of, of your own celestial kingdom sort of thing. Which is why they brought in, well, it's why they say they brought in polygamy is because the more wives that you had, the more worlds that you could be over. And so that's why it's okay for those that still believe in polygamy, and I understand the Mormon church has gotten away from that and that sort of thing, but there are those that still believe in it. Those that believe in polygamy, you'll notice it's all the guys getting wives. It ain't the wives getting guys. Why? Number one, women are smarter than that. Number two, um, because they believe that the guy will be the, the father and that the wives will be giving him the children and that there will be more worlds for them to populate in their celestial kingdom. But they look at Jesus as, as being that prophet. They also say that when Jesus said, and other sheep will hear my voice, instead of looking at it in context, which is very obvious in context, that Jesus is saying it's not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. They took it to mean that that was the, the not the excuse, but the, uh, the permission, the authority for Joseph Smith to say, and so now God's talking to me. I'm that other sheep. And God's talking to me. And also the Native Americans in, in, in America, because they believe that Jesus came to America at, at some point in time, and that he actually preached among the Native Americans. And that's how these golden tablets got to America and got buried in Missouri, I believe it is, uh, buried in Missouri. And Joseph Smith found them. And he was the only one who could see the tablets or translate the tablets. And he would put them in a hat, and he would look inside the hat, and then he would dictate. Nobody got to see the tablets or anything like that. There's a whole lot there that's, I mean, if, if you begin to study it, there's a whole lot there where you're kind of going, and people believe this? Yes, they do. Because it's been passed down from family to family. Anybody that says anything against it, well, they're just a heretic. You know, they're just an infidel. They're, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but they, they are very pro-family. They are very pro-Mormon family. Um, but Jesus does not have the same authority as Joseph Smith. I asked a, a, a Mormon one time, I said, so if there's something in the Book of Mormon, or like there's the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great, the Pearl of Great Price, I'm sorry, Doctrine and the Covenants, thank you. I, could, I, I remember there were some initials, and I couldn't remember what they were. The Doctrine and the Covenants. I said, if there is a, a discrepancy between the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine of the Covenants or Pearl of Great Price and the Holy Bible, what has the authority? And they said, well, well, you know, the thing is, is that the Bible, uh, you know, the Book of Mormon is another testament. I said, no, 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 no. What has the authority? Bible says this. Book of Mormon says this. Which one's right? Well, it would have to be the one that was written by the more recent prophet, which would be Joseph Smith. And I said, so you're telling me that the Book of Mormon would have authority over the Bible. And they said, they didn't want to say yes, but that's the answer. Yes. The answer is that if Joseph Smith wrote it, it's gospel. That's it. And it doesn't matter how many discrepancies you see. It doesn't matter how many things you can see where he, he, he plagiarized books, plagiarized other, uh, books of liter you know, other works of literature. You, it doesn't matter that when he had written some and, and the guy that was writing them down for him, uh, his wife said, well, here, I'm going to hold these and hide these, and now I want you to tell him you've lost this and see if he can read the exact same thing back again. And when he couldn't, he said, well, now God's going to make me read from another tablet. It's the same thing. It's just it's like you're reading from the NIV instead of the King James kind of thing. you know. And it's like nobody seemed to question that, but it was passed down from generation to generation. But the thing about the Mormon church, as great as it is as far as the the charity stuff they work, as great as it is, you know, they always have the family night. They always take a night where they're, where they're making sure the family is together and, and we're spending time as a family, which is a wonderful thing. We all need to be doing that, right? You know, and, and they, have, they have times where they go to each other's houses and just everything's wonderful and marvelous and, and we're going to always lift up our friends. All that sounds great, but the problem is that once they begin to say that Jesus is not who the Bible says he is, that he is not the divine, that he is not God. Once you begin to say that, you're off base. You're off base. With Catholicism, what I was going to mention, and then I'll, I'll show you why these things are so important. With Catholicism, much of that is, is similar. They believe in the Virgin Mary. In fact, they worship her. Um, you know, they, uh, they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Absolutely. There, there's no problem there. But, Jesus is not looked at as the great intercessor. 
between man and God. When we pray, how do, how do most of us end our prayer? When, we, when we're praying, we're praying, Lord, da, 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 and then we get to the end, not the amen, but right before that, what do we say? It's almost like, say, sincerely yours. We say, in Jesus' name. You know why? What we're saying is we say all of this in the name, the authority, the power of Jesus Christ because I, in myself, do not have the authority to step into the Holy of Holies and speak to God the Father. I don't have that right. I've been given that right because I am a Christian, because I am born again, because Jesus Christ paid the price and through him, through his authority, through his name, through his power, I'm now able to approach God. So we pray in Jesus' name because we believe that he is our way to the Father. In Catholicism, we know that you don't get absolved from sin until you talk to a priest. Until you talk to a priest, and then there's also something else. Uh, how many of you have ever been raised Catholic? Anybody? No? Okay. I know that like James Deacon, for example, he was raised, raised Catholic, and, and I'll be honest with you, Catholics make some of the best Pentecostals. Once they get themselves right, they make the greatest Pentecostals they, because they, they're just like, yes, I'm, I'm in this, you know, and all that kind of thing. It's almost a freedom that they feel. But, um, but the thing about with, with Catholics is they, they know that when they go to confession and they say, you know, the whole bless me, Father, I've sinned, all that kind of thing, whatever, the priest then tells them what they have to do in order to be absolved from their sin. In order for their sin to be forgiven, there's something you need to do. What they're saying by doing that is saying your confession is not good enough. You telling me that you've sinned is not good enough. But I will absolve you from sin if you will do so many Hail Marys. If you will pay a, a penance offering to the church. If you will commit to 10 hours of community service next week. If you, you know, all these kinds of things. But over and over and over and over in the word of God, it says that for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The whole thing with the Catholic religion is it's about your good works. It's about you. It's, it's not about Jesus paying the price. Yes, he paid the price and all that kind of thing. But it's about you doing works so that you can earn that salvation. Because if you were to go to a priest and you were to confess your sins and they said, well, you have to do 10 Hail Marys and you have to do a penance offering. Oh, I don't think I'm going to do that. Well, then you can't be absolved from your sin. And that's what they'll tell you. You can't be absolved from your sin. Because they believe in the Catholic religion that the priest has the power to absolve sin. We know the only one that can forgive sin is God. Now, that brings us to... Why these other religions, why we can't just say, well, they just believe a little differently. All right, the Baptists believe a little differently than we do, okay? There's a couple of things that they believe that maybe we don't believe or, or vice versa. You know, um, apostolics that are Jesus only. You know, they believe that there is no trinity, that it's all Jesus. Everything's Jesus and, and all that kind of thing. And, and I understand the concept of the trinity is very hard for us to grasp, but at the same time, there's so much evidence in the Bible uh, that there is a trinity um, that I, I'm not sure how we can how we can even go any other direction. But they do believe Jesus is, is God, and they do believe that Jesus died on the cross. They do believe they have to forgive or ask him to forgive them of their sins. I believe that there are Catholics who are going to go to heaven because they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not just a personal relationship with their priest. I believe that there are Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, uh, whatever else there is out there. I believe all of those, they're... All of those are going to have people that are going to have a personal relationship with Christ that have been born again, have given their, their lives over to him, and have allowed him to redeem them. I believe all of them are going to have it. Just like I believe that there's going to be Pentecostals that when uh, the trumpet sounds, they're going to be sitting here wondering where everybody went, unfortunately, because they've been playing games instead of actually living the life for God. But here's, here's where I want us to focus on. This is one of the biggest things we need to look at when we say, why is it that we believe what we believe? Why do we think we're right? 
You know, as, how arrogant are you to think that your religion is the only one? Well, it's not my arrogance. It's the words of Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he says himself, I am the way. He says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He says that himself in John 14, 6. That's where we get that from. So, well, who's Jesus? I mean, he's just a good teacher. He's just a prophet. Okay. John 1, 1, I've already read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Scripture telling us that Jesus Christ is God. John chapter 20 Verse 28, this is actually a very powerful passage of Scripture. I think a lot of people just sort of look it over. But John chapter 20, verse 28, this is where Jesus has already risen from the dead. And Thomas has said, look, until I put my hand in his side, until I put my fingers through the holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe that he's resurrected. Well, then actually, if you want to go up to verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. I'll, be, I'll admit, that probably would have done it for me. But Jesus went further. Then he saith to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be, faith, be not faithless, but be believing. Or, but believing. And so that's when he said, Here, do this. All right, now you don't have to doubt anymore. This next verse is incredibly powerful. Jesus, or, uh, in verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, <clears throat> My Lord and my God. He gave him the title of Lord because he had submitted to him. He had been living his whole life, or, or the last three and a half years, following Christ, doing what Christ said. He was his disciple. But then he declared that he was his God. Only God is worthy of worship. If you notice any time in the scriptures that uh, men tried to worship angels that came and brought messages, he stopped them. You know, the angels would stop them and say, no, 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 don't worship me. Don't worship me. Because they weren't worthy. There was never one time that Jesus told somebody not to worship him that began worshiping him. Because he is God and he is worthy. He's not just the son of God. And I'm not going to get into everything like that today because that's a whole lot of lessons right there. But what I am showing you is that the Bible does show us that Jesus Christ is God. If we go to uh, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 9, verse 5, this is, um, this is Paul writing. And he says, Whose are the fathers and of whom, all, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. He is declaring that he is over all. He is God. He is Elohim. He is the, he is the only one true God. And then we also see, bless you, we also see in Titus chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 13. In the book of Titus, it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I will say that some people will misinterpret that. and They'll say, well, see, it's saying the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's not what it's saying. Titus is saying in this passage of Scripture, the great God and our Savior. He's saying two different things that, all right, y'all. He's saying two different things that Jesus is. He is the great God and our Savior. The reason why I bring this up to you is this. The Bible very, very obviously, and there's many more scriptures I could give you, the Bible very obviously declares that Jesus Christ is not just Lord, but that he is God. Because of that, that means he is divine. You can say, oh, this, this broccoli salad is divine. No, it's not. It's good, but it's not divine. To be divine means that you are of or from God, that you are of the, the characteristics of God. Jesus Christ has to be divine if Scripture is true. Jesus Christ has to be God if Scripture is true. And those of you who are here for more than a carpenter, you know, we've already talked about Jesus, and you know he was either, uh, he was either a liar, a lunatic, or he was Lord. 
And we, uh, you know, I showed you over several weeks how we really can't take him as any other way except for who he said he was, and that is Lord. And he admitted that he was the Messiah. He admitted that he was God. All these things happen. So any religion that puts Jesus at any lesser level whatsoever is a false religion. It doesn't matter that Jesus is the central figure of their religion. It doesn't matter that uh, the, the encyclopedia lists it or Wikipedia lists it as uh, a Christian religion. That doesn't matter. Any religion that does not put God, uh, Jesus Christ as primary, as God, is a false religion. Here's the reason why. The best definition I've ever heard of sin is a willful and intentional transgression against the law and will of God. By definition, you can only sin against God. I can't sin against Rusty. I can tick him off. He can be mad. I can do him wrong. I can be totally, totally wrong and do him dirty. I can't sin against him because he's not God. That's why it was so important when Jesus was, uh, was healing and he had said, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then the, the Pharisees were all upset. And, oh, and he said, well, just to show you that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin, why don't you rise up and walk too? And then he got up and, and took his bed. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I guess he does it all. You know, he's a one-stop God. Hallelujah. But um, only God can forgive sin. What that means is this. If Jesus Christ is not God, when he went to the cross, nothing was done. But a man died. That's it. Because only God was able to pay the price for mankind's sin. Only God was qualified to give himself so that mankind could be forgiven. Because every single person that's ever been born on this earth with the exception of Jesus Christ, every single person has been guilty of the same price. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We all have that price. When we were born into this world, we all have that price on our head. And one of these days I'm going to talk to you about, do babies go to heaven? But anyway, we're going to talk about that. And the answer is yes, but I'll tell you why. Uh, but um, because of that, every man and every woman that was ever born was born in debt. They owed God a debt. And it wasn't until Jesus Christ paid the price. Now we're still born into that debt, but now we have a way for that debt to be resolved. Now we have a way for that debt to be paid. Now we have a way for that debt to be, uh, be taken away because Jesus Christ came and paid the price. There's like a whole bunch of lessons I want to get into here, and I'm not going to, I promise but uh, I, I'm wrapping it up. I, I, I promise you I'm wrapping it up. In the name of Jesus, I'm wrapping it up. Okay. Uh, but I, I just I wanted to make sure and bring to you today because there are a lot of religions that want to say, oh, you Christians. And then they're talking about somebody that they're not even born again. They're talking about somebody that doesn't even believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. They're talking about somebody who thinks that Jesus is on the same level as Muhammad or Buddha, or Confucius, or, or Brahma, or Vishnu, or, or whomever. You know, believe, and it's like, no, 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 no. You can't, and it, it, it offends me, to be honest with you. It offends me when I hear people called Christian, and I know for a fact that they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. It offends me. It's like, how dare you give them that moniker? How dare you say that they are of Christ, that they are a follower of Christ when they don't even believe that he's God. So when, when you have people that will say that about different religions and, oh, it's a Christian religion, it don't start a fight, but no, deep down inside, no, it's not. Because a Christian religion is going to look and is going to see, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And you know what else? The Word was God. At the very beginning, he was God. And guess what? He still is. He still is 
today. Even when he came down and he put on a robe of flesh, he never took off his robe of divinity. He was 100% man and yet 100% God. Holy and righteous and without sin and the only price, the only one who could pay the price for our sins. All right, like I said, there's a lot we could get into there, but we just don't have time. Maybe I'll do a conference and everybody will come out or not come out. I don't know. Anyway, but uh, I do want to have a moment before I forget. Does anyone have any question or comment that they would like to make about what we talked about tonight? Yes, Ms. Sherry. Was I, was I mostly right about what I was saying? Okay, all right, good. Absolutely. Well, okay, hold on one second, because uh, for those of you who are listening online, you probably didn't hear, but Sister Sherry was saying about how uh, her dad would say, like, with born again, well, that's something that the Baptists do. And um, so so the Mormons will say that's something that the Baptists do, even though Jesus himself said in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Wow. What? She said that they never heard one scripture in 27 years? How can you say that you are a Christ-centered religion if you don't even read his word? That blows my mind. That blows my mind. I, I Because I knew that, like I said, I knew that they give the authority to the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price and all that kind of thing. But I, just, I assumed that they read the Bible because you can even, I, I don't know if you remember the commercials, they really don't have them on much anymore. But you you could call this number and they'll send you a Bible along with the Book of Mormon. You know, and, and I was always curious what version of the Bible, you know, that they were going to send me. And I, I never did because I didn't want to get on a mailing list, to be honest with you. But but uh, that just, that blows my mind. It's like, but the whole thing is supposed to be centered on Christ, but I guess it really isn't. I guess it really has just gone more to it's about Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and about, wow, wow, isn't that interesting? And yet they're still called a Christian religion. Wow, okay. All right, well, see, you learn something every day. Thank you very much for sharing that. All right, anybody else that you had a, a comment about this? I mean, don't don't talk about like, well, you know, I was at the store today. All right, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, dismiss and don't forget about tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Bring some good food, would you? I'm hungry. So uh, but let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, dismiss this evening. I really appreciate all of you coming out. Please make sure you get some coffee or uh, coffee uh, if you want to uh, before you leave. But uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. I thank you, Jesus, that you are God. You aren't just a prophet. You aren't just... Uh, just a lesser God. You aren't a minor God. You are God, the creator of all the, that is. We worship you and we lift you up and we praise the name that is above every other name. Lord, I pray that you will help us to have a greater desire to study your word so that when others try to come in, in the semblance of Christianity, when they try to come and, and be clothed in Christianity, but knowing that deep inside that there is nothing about Christ in that. Lord, I pray that we'll see through that and that we'll protect ourselves. But also, Lord, just as Sister Sherry was saying, God, that we will we'll pray with them. We'll work with them. Instead of disdaining them, instead of uh, just saying we're not going to listen, Lord, that we'll try what we can to show them the truth so that they might possibly respond. And I pray you'll soften their hearts and give us those opportunities. Keep us safe as we go home tonight. We give you all glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. See you tomorrow night.